really making sure that you have a foundation that allows you to scale is really important because what you can find is you could tap into something, but without good systems and processes behind the scenes, you're working 100 hours a week because you're having to manually send payment requests via Stripe and you're having to manually onboard someone into the system because you don't have it well documented and haven't been able to successfully delegate it to someone else. In today's episode, our host, Mark Murphy, has a conversation with Nick Sonnenberg, a multifaceted personality. Nick is an entrepreneur, a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, an Inc. columnist, and a guest lecturer at Columbia University. As the founder and CEO of Leverage, a front runner in operational efficiency consultancies, he has designed the CPR Business Efficiency Membership, as outlined in his book, Come Up for Air. Nick's unique perspective on time, efficiency, and automation is a direct result of his eight-year tenure as a high-frequency trader on Wall Street. The CPR Business Efficiency Membership has proven to consistently deliver increased output, less stress, happier employees, and even the potential to gain an extra full day per week in productivity per person. This is achieved by simply utilizing the right tools in the right way at the right time. Nick's team has made significant strides across all industries, catering to organizations of all sizes, from burgeoning startups to Fortune 10 entities. During the episode, Mark and Nick dive into the latter's definition of a hero as someone willing to undertake uncomfortable tasks that many would shy away from. Listeners will get a glimpse of Nick's early entrepreneurial journey as he shares stories of selling figs from a local tree and baseball cards around his neighborhood. He also offers invaluable insights on the intricate pieces of the entrepreneurial puzzle, understanding your product or service, knowing your offering, pricing, and client base. Be sure to join in as Mark and Nick embark on this enlightening dialogue. Enjoy the show. Today, I'm here to talk to uh, a gentleman who is also an author. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. He's a uh, Wall Street Journal bestselling author of a book, uh, Up in the Air, and a guest lecturer at Columbia University. Uh, welcome to the podcast, Nick Sonnenberg. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Mark. Hey, you know, I, I call this podcast, Nick, the uh, Hero of the Hour podcast, because I like to have people on the podcast that are either, you know, heroes to me or heroes to other folks. And I always like to just kind of ask the question, you know, who are who are some of your heroes or or how do you describe a hero? I think I, I describe a hero as someone that's willing to do something uncomfortable that a lot of people wouldn't be be willing to do. And 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 oftentimes it's a selfless, selfless acts that this person is willing to do. Um you know, I try to be a hero uh, to my team and to my, you know, to my my clients and potential clients. I'm trying to give back people the gift of time and, you know, my company Leverage, we do operational efficiency training and consulting for people. So we're help, you know, ultimately we're trying to give people back an extra business day a week to do whatever they want with. And so in that respect, uh, I'm trying to be a hero to all employees inside of companies and all my clients and potential clients. Um, you know, you know, you you promise almost like the holy grail, which uh, and <laughs> and you know, meaning it's about balancing you know work and life. And you know, yeah. I, I'd love, I, I'd love, I think people would love to hear some of the strategies that you've developed to kind of achieve that kind of work life balance and and wellness. Sure. Uh, I think sure. it's, uh, I mean, it's 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 clearly the the holy grail. Yeah, I mean. It's a cliche, but you know, time, <laughs> time is our most valuable asset, you know, and you can just like money, you can spend time, um, you can invest time. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different things you can do with time. I, I, I lay it all out in my book. Here's a, I sent you a copy, Mark. I read it. It's, it's, a, it's a, I think anybody, anybody who's in business should read it. Yeah. So we lay out my framework in the book called CPR. Um, it stands for communicate, plan, and resource. It turns out there's, we've been doing this for a long time, Mark. We've probably helped thousands of companies at this point. doesn't matter if you're listening right now, if you're a financial advisor, if you're a multi-billion dollar tech company, there's three buckets that you have to be thinking about to be efficient as a team. You need to first and foremost communicate efficiently internally with your team, externally with clients and vendors. 
And there's different technologies that you can use uh, to do this. There, we recommend in the book, uh, you want to use email for external communication. So Outlook and Gmail should be external communication. And then tools like Microsoft Teams and Slack should be for internal. Um, next, you've got project management tools and planning. So that's the P. The an example that I use is if you were to take your team camping in the forest, you would need walkie talkies to communicate, but you'd also need map a map to navigate out of the forest. And so you've got these walkie talkie tools like Slack, Gmail, Outlook, Microsoft Teams, but you also need a map. So that's like Asana, Slack, uh, Asana, Monday, ClickUp, so on and so forth. Anything that you ask someone to do something by a certain date, that shouldn't be in a communications tool because it's you've probably been there before where it slips through the cracks and then you're chasing someone like, hey, I know I told Nick to do this. Well, if you texted it to me or emailed it to me, there's a high chance it's going to get lost because it's just put in the wrong... That tool isn't built for that purpose. Um, and then lastly, you have your resources. So you have intellectual property, SOPs, processes. Your core values needs to be documented somewhere. How you onboard a new team member needs to be documented somewhere. And so there's different tools for that. You've got tools like Process Street to document process. And then you've got uh, digital wikis like Coda and Notion and Confluence and so on and so forth. So this might sound like a lot of different tools, you know, and if you're used to running your company on text or an email, it is additional tools. So it, it is more than just those one or two tools, but these things are fundamental. And if you want to have a high performing team, you need to use tools built for purpose within each of those categories because they're such critical ca categories. You know, if you're going to take your team back to that forest and you wanted to chop down a tree, you could do it with a Swiss army knife, but you're probably better off with a chainsaw. And so you want to use a chainsaw for communicating. You want to use the chainsaw okay. of managing tasks and projects. You want to use a chainsaw for your company wiki. You don't want to just you know, hack it because it's easier to have one tool. Um, and the name of the game with all of this stuff from a mindset shift is you want to be optimizing for retrieval of information in your team, not for transfer. When people get overwhelmed, I called my book, Come Up For Air, Stop, uh, Come Up For Air because everyone's drowning in work. And when you're drowning in work, you try to cut corners and you start playing hot potato with each other. It's like, hey, Mark, just take it. Here's a text or an email. There's no rhyme or reason. It's just whatever's fastest for you as an individual in the moment. But what happens when everyone's playing this game where everyone's optimizing for him or, for him or herself, the team as a whole is suboptimal. And so when everyone's just transferring as fast as possible, it makes it 10 times harder to find what you're looking for next week or next month. And in your personal life, you do something similar. When you, when you do your laundry, the fastest way to be done would be you take it out of the dryer and you throw it in one drawer. But you don't do that. You stop and you separate your socks in one drawer, your underwear in another, not because it's the fastest way to be done with laundry, but tomorrow when you need to put an outfit together, it's much faster to retrieve. So you've got all these different drawers in business, just like you have drawers for your clothes. And you have to be aligned with your team what drawer each different piece belongs to so it's easier to retrieve uh, that is you know one of, do you think most people are looking to retrieve one full day a week or they're looking to add 20 percent more to their to their day what, what are most of your clients looking for <laughs> they just want any breathing room when i tell them that i could probably give them back a full day they think i'm crazy um, I, I, you know a lot of people are just like man if you could even give me back 10 minutes that would be huge or 30 minutes that would be huge you know, if you had an extra 30 minutes a week to, to do more sales calls or whatever you need, um, you know, in a lot of cases, that's huge. So some people come to me because they need time savings um, and they're, they're completely overwhelmed. Um, some also come because their culture is being impacted. They, you know, trust has deteriorated, deteriorated, deteriorated across their team and they don't trust it you know, people on their team. And it's not that they don't trust that, you know, Bill is going to steal from them. They just don't trust that Bill is going to get the project done on time. And it might not be Bill's fault. It might just be that Bill doesn't have a good system to prioritize and track stuff. So they come to me because they both want to save time, but also want to uh, help improve their team's culture. You know, you deal, I know, with some very, very large companies. If somebody's watching this podcast, how small an organization 
would sort of be the floor of somebody that that you that that would benefit from your company? Uh, I mean, honestly, you should start this stuff from the very beginning. Like, even if you're just by yourself, because even by yourself, learning how to use email properly is going to help you save a few hours a week. And the sooner that you could start documenting best practices, you know, you just start defining this is the way we do payroll. This is the best practice of how we should do a sales call. This is how we should do this. You know, the sooner you can be replaced, the sooner you could hire the next person to get up to speed. So I don't think that there really is a floor. I think you could start the stuff from the very beginning. Um, but if you're very early on, you know, maybe, maybe you don't go too crazy with it and you just start implementing parts of it that are most strategic for you in your, in your use case. But it's not a zero or one thing. If you're, it, a, I was going to say your, 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 uh, the, the work that you do is so valuable because there are so many entrepreneurs that just have such great ideas and operationally, they're just a disaster. I mean, that's, I, you know, we we're we're key business strategists, critical thinkers, financial advisors to about 4,000 entrepreneurs. Yep. And m the majority of them are a hot mess, even though they're, <laughs> yeah. even though, even though they're very successful and very brilliant. And and what size are they? And I'm, I'm sure there's a huge variance. But yeah, what it's, size? It's, it's, you know, we're certainly not in the Fortune 1000 world, other than we do some work with some of the senior executives there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say most of ours are closely held entrepreneurial businesses with anywhere from, you know, you know, a handful to maybe a thousand employees, a couple thousand employees. Yeah. I mean, look, complexity scales exponentially with team size. So, you know, you get to a thousand employees, that's some complexity there. Um you know, even if you get to a hundred, there's there's complexity. The sooner that you fix this stuff, the easier it is. And oftentimes, people get to that size because not no one's like wishing like, hey, my dream in life is to run a, a thousand person team. You know, if 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 you could run the same revenue, more profit, less headache with five hundred people, most people right. would take the five hundred option. So people add employees because they're looking for capacity. Um, and usually hiring people is, you know, the most expensive way to increase capacity because you have to pay for recruiting, onboarding, training, pay for a payroll. Um, and then you have the, the extra complexity of managing different people, more, exponentially more ways for information to slip through the cracks, personalities to, to balance, so on and so forth. So, you know, if, if you could alternatively get more capacity out of everyone by just removing all the wasted scavenger hunt activities of crap that adds no value and you can get an extra 20% out of everyone. Maybe, maybe that'll help you to not, not need to add all this extra overhead. Well, I, a lot of your, do, one of the things I want to do is one of the things I want to do right after this call is I want to schedule uh, a time with, with, with you and our partners to talk about how you can help our organization. Oh, I, uh, happy to, how, how, how big is your organization, Mark? We're, uh, we're in the mid thirties in terms of employees. Okay, that's but that's uh, but but again, size. when you when you say those things, it's uh, but we're scaling. I think I I would think that we'd uh, double in size over the next three years, and I think as you can see that complexity, all the things you're talking about are just you know hitting me like a two by four across the yeah you know, across the forehead. Yeah. Well, what if you could double the revenue but only increase your team by twenty percent? You know, wouldn't that be wouldn't uh, that be better? You're a, uh, you know, that's a, uh, it's, it's almost unfair. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's your, you're, 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 yeah. you got to deliver because it's, it's, that's the, that's the, <laughs> that's the tease. Well, you know, one, one of the things I was going to say to you though, is that um, with so many, with the pandemic, so many people virtual working to work, one of your specialties has been trying to, you know, building successful virtual teams. I, I, tell me how, tell me what that looks like. I, I think that the stuff that I talk about and all the stuff that we're helping businesses with, both in my book and and through leverage, it 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 holds true whether you're virtual, hybrid, or or in person. I I believe that tools like Slack and are you on Microsoft, Mark? Uh, we're, we're on or Google. G, we're on Google. Google. So you so knowing how to use Gmail properly, you want to do that whether you decide tomorrow to go hybrid, virtual, or or stay co -located. Are you co located? Uh, no, one. You're virtual. Uh, no, 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 we're we're. I apologize. We are in person. We are one person, one floor. Uh, you know, uh, there's some people that work, you know, occasionally from home, yeah. but uh, the uh, this is the challenge. The challenge we have in our company is we've also got a lot of very bright, very talented, but also very young people and young with the organization. And it just seemed to seemed to me that I I've kind of old school and trying to one one of the, one of the reasons I was so excited to have you on this podcast is. 
kind of old school thinking that I needed to be here more often and I needed to make sure that I was there leading the team. And I think that, uh, you know, I, I think there may be alternative ways to accomplish the same thing. And I've got some limiting mindsets. I think that there's a lot of benefits to working in person from a culture standpoint. Um, but I don't think that there's any difference of strategy in terms of wanting to leverage systems and tools properly. You want to do that whether you're in person or not. It's just if you're not in person, like you have zero chance if you're so, but and all, all roads still lead to, you want people to use Gmail properly. Like you want them to be getting the inbox zero and not wasting, we see three to five hours a week wasted time because people just don't know. Like we have a system called RAD, reply, archive, defer. Super simple to teach. That alone can help, can help someone save hours a week in email. It doesn't matter if that person's physically with you in the office or not. You want them to know RAD and not be wasting time. Same with tools like Slack or tools like um, a project management software. Whether you're in person or not, you still want people to know exactly, be able to click a button and know what should I work on today or what's the status of that client. Um, you, you want all those things to be well organized, but you know, being being physically with people does build. Um, a a better sense of culture sometimes and 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 bonds people. So if you aren't all working in an office together, I would encourage you know like a quarterly meetup with at least your direct team, so you still get that face to face. Because Zoom is great, but you know there are limitations to it. Yeah, I'm. Uh, it's become a great transportation device, but I uh, you know. And by the way, I I think it's gone. You know what was so great about Zoom and the pandemic is. You know, with technology, it's hard to get older people to embrace it. Zoom is embraced by 90-year-old grandparents. Yep. You talk to their grandchildren on it, so you don't have to teach them how to use it. But I believe that some of the magic does occur not in the meeting, but after the meeting. It happens over drinks. It happens over a cup of coffee at the break. It, totally. You know, that, and you don't totally. get that on Zoom. You can't, you, can't, uh, you, you can't replicate that in any, any place. Yeah. Tell me about so I don't up- want to take away from that. Like, I'm not one of these people that's like pure technology. Like, you could be... We run a, a completely remote company, and you know we've been we've, we've been able to be successful at it. But it 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 did come with challenges, and we do have in person meetings so that we still can you know see people face to face and have that connectiveness. Tell me what was the inspiration for writing "Come Up Come Up," you know, for air. Uh, I, I thought it was a really great book. I got a chance to read it. It got me excited about you know. In fact, it didn't get me excited. It got me like. I felt like uh, I was I felt like I was getting beaten up by reading the book because I saw I, I kept seeing all of our shortcomings uh, as I read it. But uh, t- tell tell g- g- give me two or three or four takeaways of if somebody is, is thinking about buying that book or thinking about hiring your company, what would that what would the two or three takeaways that they would come from come up with air, come up for air? So I'll start with why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because I know firsthand what it's like to drown in work. Um, my story is we we built leverage very quickly at the very beginning it was a freelancer marketplace that we grew to about 150 people on the team seven figures of revenue um which sounds impressive but made a lot of mistakes along the way one of the mistakes was the org chart was just me and my co-founder and then we had no no one underneath except for the 150 people um and we had a we scaled prematurely uh we we had a lot of debt we we're losing a lot of money And so we really optimized just for this fast growth. And one day we were having coffee and he taps me on the shoulder and he tells me he's out not in two weeks or two days, he's out in two minutes. And, you know, I start sweating. I'm like, oh my God, like we probably are going to go bankrupt. Because again, although we had this superficial success under the hood, we had a lot of problems. And within three months, we lose 40% of clients um, and team members for that matter. Bank accounts are getting frozen, cashing out my 401k. Dad's taking a second mortgage on his house. You know, I had to make a choice. Do we bankrupt this company or do I, do I um, clean it up? And I decided to clean it up. One, I thought it was unethical to a lot of people we owed services to still. And two, I, I could see where we were inefficient. And, I, and I, I was confident that I'd be able to turn it around. And so that was the genesis of this CPR framework that's the core of the book. And so I started. I started, you know, working really for for a period of time working very late nights and weekends 
uh, cleaning things up. Um, and I started realizing like we needed to communicate better. We weren't able to, you know, click a button and manage our tasks and projects as easily as we could be. Uh, we were pretty good already on the R of CPR, the documenting knowledge. And so very quickly things started turning around and then people started reaching out to me, asking me to consult them on their businesses. So I had the honor of working with like Tony Robbins reached out and um, Poopery and other interesting companies. And I found that everyone was having kind of very similar issues. And when you think about it, tools like Slack, Gmail has been around for a while, but Slack and Asana and all these tools are relatively new and no one's ever been taught best practices of how to get the most out of these things. You know, these software companies, you know, they, they just want you to use their software and they'll build how to's, but they're not teaching you when to not use their software. Right. You know, what problems does this not solve? They are just motivated to get you in there as much as possible. And then that starts um, making people adopt bad habits and you're using the wrong tool for the wrong problem. And so I saw this opportunity to create the playbook that could align people. Like what's the use case of each of these tools, not just how to use the tools, but what's the, but when to use the tools and the nuance of best practice. And so we decided to, I saw some crazy, crazy results from the work that we did, not just internally at leverage, but also with our clients. And so we decided to pivot the entire model to become a training and consulting company for all these new modern tools because we saw the impact and it was a nice niche, um, niche that there wasn't really any competitors in. Um, what was your other question? I, I, I a million questions, but I was going to say, you know, one of the things I, I appreciate is the the battle scars. You know, the fact you're thinking about going bankrupt, you're you're thinking about getting your parents up a second mortgage, you're thinking about all these other things. You're thinking probably, you know, and and by the way, I I'm of the firm belief that entrepreneurs are an endangered species, meaning that you know when we grew up, people that were hardworking, worked hard, and were successful were the people to look up to. And now in some play, some parts of our society, there are people that are, you know, are are scorned. And I, I think America to succeed needs and the world needs great entrepreneurs like 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 you. You know, I'm a serial entrepreneur myself. Um yeah. do you think entrepreneurs are they born or are they made? Um, I think it's probably a bit of both, but I think uh, hard to say. I think I think I was born an entrepreneur. I mean, like, you know, even from like a young age, you know, those stories, like I'm selling figs around the block off, <laughs> you know, I was picking off the fig tree and, you know, selling baseball cards and other things. So I always had entrepreneurial spirit and, you know, risk tolerance. Um, so I think that there's just, I think that there is a personality trait there that you kind of either have or you don't have. Um, but. Well, you sort of let's left something good to move to something that was great. It sounded like when you shifted yeah. your, your business, your business model and, well, and obviously some very famous and successful people have, have, uh, have bought into, to, to, uh, all of the wonderful things that you, you guys are doing. Um, it, I, the other thing too, is I, I also liked when I was talking and reading about your ability to, uh, collaborate and build successful, you know, business relationships. I think people, uh, are, are, I think that's something that everybody wants to do, but I'm not sure everybody does it as well as they could. Well, I forget who told me this. It might have been uh, Dorbin Harbinger from the Art of Charm podcast. I think he said, it might have been, I think it was him. You know, you could go bankrupt and the IRS could take all of your money, but they can't take away your network. And that really stuck with me. You know, I think that my, my biggest asset is my, my network and my relationships that I have. And as that relates to efficiency and systems, um, part, a big part of the reason why I, claim, you know, why I feel like I, I have good relationships and strategic relationships, a lot of it is because I have good systems to make sure that I'm keeping in touch with the people I want to keep in touch with. And if you tell me after this, like you would love to have that PDF on, you know, how to get to inbox zero. I have a place to take, to, to, to note that, and you could bet your life on it that you're going to get that. So I have high follow through. I, I'm able to track kind of the people that I need to be getting in touch with and not. Um, and 
you know, a combination of a whole lot of different things, I've been able to um, maintain, you know, very valuable, meaningful relationships. And I, I view that as my biggest asset. It, it, that is, it's interesting. And you spend a lifetime investing in those relationships. I've, yeah. uh, you know, I, th I think one of the things I try to t teach our advisors is that, that, that investing in those, uh, yeah, you know that one of the things if you take if you if you you know I've been you know, with Dan Sullivan uh, mostly on for since 1994, and one of the things that became co so clear working with Strategic Coach was that I decided I wanted to be a hero to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial thinking people, and we've just developed a network around people who want to be a hero to the same group, and created some entrepreneurial synergy of just being able to, you know. I mean, you know, as I, as I said, you know, one of the one of the interesting things I'm 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 interested in working with your company with is one is I want to tra be able to help continue to transform my company, but more importantly, when that works, I then now have another tool to then help transform other companies that people are working with. Yeah, and then, you know, then it's you know, it's who not how who you know who do we need to collaborate with to create that uh, that, uh, that 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 mindset. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. You also talk a lot. Uh, talk a little bit about scaling. Uh, you know, and lessons you've learned from growing multiple successful companies. Um, care to comment on that? Well, I think that I've learned a lot of lessons. Um, and I guess success, everyone has their own uh, definition. But I think that one big lesson that I learned was premature scaling can almost cripple you. And you know, not to be promoting operational efficiency the, the whole time here, but really making sure that you have a foundation that allows you to scale is really important because what you can find is you could tap into something, but without good systems and processes behind the scenes, you're working 100 hours a week because you're having to manually send payment requests via Stripe and you're having to manually onboard someone into the system because you don't have it well documented and haven't been able to successfully delegate it to someone else. And so my advice would just be that it's always a balance of top line revenue efforts and bottom line revenue efforts and the optimal allocation of what percentage of your time you're spending on top line versus bottom line will be a different mix depending on where you're at in your in your life cycle. But it, you need to be aware that it you know, maybe you're choosing to put 0% into foundation. That's fine. Maybe there's a reason. But, you know, usually it should be at least, you know, 5%, 10% um, that you're always kind of thinking about it. And maybe if you're more mature and you, you can afford to, maybe that should go to 30%, 40%, um, depending on cases. But I think just being aware that every, everything that you're doing right now to optimize for your top line revenue is effort and energy away from doing something that helps you, you know, strengthen that foundation to scale further. And so it's just a, a trade-off. Um, what else? The question was, what have I learned in my scaling? I, I, another thing I've learned is, you know, every business you have attraction, conversion, and retention. You know, attractions, marketing, conversion, sales, retention. If you're especially in a service business, you know, it's retaining your clients. If you're in a software business, it's you know, what percentage of people stick around continuing to pay you that recurring revenue most people at least i in the early days you know the marketing is the sexy stuff you know people like how big is your email list how big is your following and so it's easy to get sucked into the trap of going from left to right and left to right and starting with attraction and then figuring out conversion and then figuring out retention but what i realized and what shifted my entire strategy when we almost went bankrupt is we're going to go right to left and actually, when, when the crap hit the fan, um, I actually shut off marketing and sales, which was very counterintuitive. And most people thought I was insane. But I said, look, we have a retention issue here. Like We're not actually servicing the clients to the quality that they're expecting. And so you know, we were growing at like 20% a month, but 15% were leaving every month. So we were net growing 5% a month but it was good marketing masking an underlying problem. So when my business partner left, I was just stuck with 15% churn each month. That's a pretty uncomfortable place to, to be stuck with. So you can't fix all problems at the same time. And that churn was a function of not having found product market fit and having correct processes to successfully deliver you know, the freelancer services that we had back then. And so I just put all efforts into that. 
and shut off marketing and, and uh, sales. Once we started, once we got that under control, and that let me know, okay, we're actually de uh, delivering a, a high value product now. Okay, well now let's work on sales. Uh, because like, what's the point of acquiring leads if you can't convert them? And what's the point of converting them if you can't retain them? So, you know, I think going from right to left and focusing on retention first, then moving on to conversion. And then once, once, you, once you are pretty confident that every phone call that comes in, that you're going to be able to convert them and have them stay, you know, then put gasoline on the fire and figure out the marketing channel. You know, one of the things that a little controversial, I think, is I think that for most people who are entrepreneurs, um, they want to lift up the lives of all the people they touch. And that's under their customers or their clients. It's the people that work with them. It's that it's a higher purpose for most people in terms of running their business. And I think there's so many good things like people would want to give everybody a chance and they want diversity and they want inclusion and they want a, a great place to work. We want people enjoy you know, a highly productive environment of where to work. But as the world is shifting, um, is there is there do you think there is an overreaction to sort of the woke strategies? I think we're reading in the papers today that you know several of the banks that have collapsed they collapsed because of woke policies. They got out of the banking business and into the woke business. Um, you know, or or you know, I mean, it's, I, it's a weird question to ask me because like. I also come from a banking background and like I come from a high, I used to be a high frequency trader on wall street for eight years. So I come from, you know, like just get the work, get the work done. Right. You know, like there, there was like, as long as I'm making money, like everything's fine. And we all respected each other, but a lot of this stuff that is happening now, I'm just, I don't know. Yeah. The, the, I think that some of it is helpful, but I think a lot of it, I think there's been almost like an overcorrection and sometimes people are leaning on the woke stuff. It almost feels like as an excuse to, to, to not work hard or to not get work done. So I think it's a slippery slope and, and um, entrepreneurs and business owners are in a, a tricky spot with it. Um, but, you know, we're also living through like a, a weird economy right now and there's a lot of layoffs happening and so on and so forth. So, you know, I think a lot of people in these positions, they might get laid off because, you know, the company's just not performing where it needs to and clients aren't coming in like they, like they used to. And so maybe, maybe there'll be like a middle ground that we land with all this woke stuff. Um, yeah, I, I, it's like, I see the pendulum swinging a couple of years ago was if you were not woke, you're a corporation being sued. And now you're seeing a comeback where they're now suing, starting to sue corporations for woke policies that cost shareholders value. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, yeah, out, and, huh? and, and like, it's like, you're like, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I find, you know, I find, you know, you, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, and I, fi I find like the, the most important thing. And I, and I told you, we were in the mid thirties in our organization, but, but part of the organization is, is making sure that you get the right people in the organization. I mean, you remember, there's probably 10% of the world that's that's looking to be insulted. <laughs> you don't need them in your organization, or yeah. you're, you know, you need people that have the right culture and the right fit. But I, 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 I want to run a highly ethical company. I want to give everybody opportunity. I want to, um, I want to create abundance in every area of my life. But I, I also, you know, I, I'm also, I'm not a big Star Wars guy, but I love the Yoda quote. You know do or don't do, there is no try. You know, and I think sometimes that, that a lot of these uh, issues kind of kind of mask uh, performance because we, you know, we spend a lot of, spend a lot of time doing things, other, other things like that. So I'd love to figure out a way where America could get to a balance where we could be inclusive and, and still, and, and still, still be as highly efficient and the most efficient people in the world. Uh, yeah. Like I agree, like you need to be respectful. You have to be, you have to respect people and so on and so forth. Um, I really believe in OKRs and setting kind of clear objectives with people so you can measure their performance. Um, but yeah, I, I, don't, I don't agree with the overly woke um, stuff that I'm seeing out there where it seems like there's just people wanting to complain 
all day long and you know lean on that versus getting their work done yeah um the the uh anything else that you think that if somebody's watching this you'd say you know they're trying to build i, I think virtually everything you've talked about i think it makes a lot of sense virtually every company is trying to build high performing teams yeah. um do you as you in your experience are these entrepreneurs properly prepared for that i guess it matters there's different aspects to high performing teams you know improving your culture will help improve your performance improving your operational efficiency which is the aspect we're we're focused on will help with it you know doing proper objectives and key results so people really understand what matters most and what they're going to be held accountable to. So there's a lot of different dimensions to it. Um, and I think they're all important. And, you know, entrepreneurs, especially if you're early, early on, there's a lot that you got to do. You have to, you know, figuring out your product or your service and hitting product market fit, knowing your offer and your pricing and who are your clients and where do you find it? Like all of those are, are essential early on, but you know, once you kind of have cracked that, then, you know, establishing that core team, you know, do you have the right people on the bus? Are they, are they on the right seat? What's your culture? And how do you actually work together, which is the part that I'm, you know, you know, more of an expert in. Um, I think they're all important pieces to the puzzle and you, you can't not be thinking about any one of those pieces. You know, Richard Branson talks about, you know, they ask him, does he have a business life and does he have a personal life? He goes, no, I just have a life yep. where I'm doing all the things I want to do all the time. <laughs> and, you know, and, you know, and yeah. I, I would say that, you know, I, well, my life maybe is- he's, Maybe he's a good hero example. Yeah, I, I, you know, and that's what he talks about. And I, but I think, I think, first of all, I think if you're an entrepreneur, you have to at some level like business. Um, you know, I, I like business, I you know, but I, I love my downtime. I love spending time with my family and my, you know, with Lisa and the kids and, you know, and, and friends. And I love going, you know, I, I, I'm a little exhausted today because I, I drove, uh, drove home in the middle of the night watching my Hoosiers lose the NCAA tournament last night. Who did uh, they play? Uh, Miami. Hmm. We started off poorly and we took the lead uh, early in the second half and didn't, didn't happen. Where did you go? The, it's at the Kelly school of business. Over yeah. There? And, uh, it was it was great it was terrific so another disappointing season but uh mm -hmm. so i'm i'm not only tired i'm disappointed today oh. but uh but but you know but i i think when you you talk a lot about achieving success and fulfillment yep what does that mean so for me you know i like what you were saying about richard branson it's like you know it's not about work life balance it's work life integration and how can i spend as much time as possible on things that give me joy or are, you know, Dan Sullivan words, you know, tap into my unique ability, but intellectually stimulating, like how much of, how much of my time do I, do I spend on, on things that give me joy or are intellectually stimulating and what I value to be high value, um, time slots. And it's really that uh, it's not necessarily like if I hit for me, like, if I'm making a hundred million a year, but I'm overweight and I'm unhealthy and I'm not spending any time with people I want to spend with, that wouldn't be success to me. You know, someone making a hundred thousand dollars a year, but you know, is living the life that they want to live and, you know, in good shape, in good health, not stressed, you know, spend time reading books and intellectually stimulated. I'd, I'd rather be that person. So I think it's really just, you have to define for yourself what you're trying to optimize for. For me, it, you know, I think money is a great way to get more freedom. Um, so there's definitely financial goals, but at the end of the day, if I can work with who I want on what I want, when I want, I'm spending time with people I want to spend time with on a personal level. I can uh, engage in hobbies. Like I love playing chess. You know, if I can play speed chess in Washington square park, um, and you know, that's fun for me if I'm in good, he good health, you know, I'm working out almost every day, you know, like that, that for me is, is my success. It doesn't necessarily have to be a dollar amount. I think people have said that what the, I, I thought it was described pretty well where they talked about the four things you need in life. You need health, you need wealth, 
you need purpose and you need love. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think, you know, too many people that, that I've run into over the years thought they had to give up one or two to get the others. And I think, Mm -hmm. and I think to me, to me, a successful and a fulfilling life would be to have all four of those things and not that one or two of them don't get out of balance from time to time, but you can kind of monitor it almost like your blood chemistry, you know, trying to, trying to get them in, in line. But I think yep. doing the things that you doing the things that you want to do and doing them when you want to do, how you want to do it. And, 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 and there, and I, I think so few people get to that in life. They're always on someone else's time frame. And I think one of the great things about being an entrepreneur is you, 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 you truly are, in, you know, you know, call the shots. Pros and cons, because sometimes it's pretty lonely. But <laughs> yeah. how, well, how, how about that? With, with you've got you talk about a network, though. But do you have people like I? I would uh, I would used to to talk to uh, you know, like early on in my career. I I would uh, I would never. I had a couple of buddies that I would never call them when I when I when some big deal went down or something amazing happened. I would always call them when I just got my ass kicked. So I'd call them on the phone, tell them what happened. And then five minutes later, we'd be laughing about the whole thing and just, you know, yeah. just go, oh, what an asshole that guy was or what, a, oh, can you imagine this happened or that happened? And it, 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 it's there, that that's part of your network is also a support group. Yeah, for sure. And I'm, I'm, I'm very uh, grateful. Like I have some very close people to me, you know, you mentioned strategic coach. Um, I do a monthly call with Shannon Waller and we talk business. Um, me too. L- too. Oh, you do? Yeah, she's great. Um, Lee Brower, who's also a coach, is one of one of my dear friends. Actually, when when I had my business partner break up and uh, um, he was calling a bunch of clients, telling them to go and work with him, all the kind of VIP clients, Lee Brower was one of them. And it was crazy. I lost 40% of clients in three months. Everyone just went to work with my ex-business partner. Lee was the only person that called me out of the blue and said, look, I, I, I know you from a load of wood, uh, but I just got this weird call and I know there's two sides to a story. I wanna hear what's going on from your side. And that kicked off this beautiful friendship and Lee and I have done workshops together and I go to his group and speak and he comes to my group and speak and we do a, a bi-weekly call. Um, Jay Abraham, me and him are very close friends. If I've got business questions, I'll go to him and me and him are launching a podcast, which it would be great to have you on our podcast. We're doing these fun hot seat style podcast um, things where people come with a business challenge or something they want to brainstorm. And we just do a brainstorming session and we record it as a podcast. Um, and the, like my official mentor is uh, Chip Conley. He was the chief strategy officer of Airbnb. He wrote a, a book called Peak. And we do, we do a check-in. So I, I'm very grateful that I've got some extremely smart people in my in my network that i can lean on to get advice from as needed well i don't think there's any uh, i mean if, again that's dan you know if you, if you want to see your life in 10 years it's the books you read the people you hang out with and people say people people, people change it but i think you're the average of the 10 people you hang out with the most right yeah, yeah. Which, uh, sure. we, who are your mentors well i you know i mean clearly dan uh having been in the program almost exclusively for close to 30 years has transformed how I've thought. It's allowed me to really elevate thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other thing too is I had some very powerful, uh, like Fortune 500 CEOs and C-suite folks, who, when I was very young in my 20s and early 30s, I, I think they worked so hard they didn't have the best relationship with their kids, and I became almost like an adopted son. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, you know now that I'm you know much older. But but those folks really kind of kind of taught me business, took me under the wing, and showed me how to how to run that pro, run that business. And you know, and, and I and I think the other thing too is I I'm at the point now in my businesses where I only get involved in places where I can move the needle, where I probably have an, a board seat or one of our group has a board seat on that company or more. And it's it's with a group of people that we not only like each other, we know how to execute, we trust each other, and where, you know, you know, where, you know, I, I you know, I, I love that. I, I love that when I'm looking at a different company to buy, or I'm looking at trying to make my company more efficient, I, I know that I've got like four or five guys that I trust that I can sit down and go, they're going to tell me the truth. Like, is this bullshit or where's the possibility? What am I missing here? Here's what I see it. You know, can I, you know, and help me kind of think through that process. And then I, you know, obviously you keep your own counsel open to their, their own, their own advice. Um, 
gotten very heavily involved in politics. So it, it, it you know, I'm, you know, I, I obviously I've got some folks in the, uh, in the lobbying and, you know, obviously, in, you know, governors and senators and congressmen that we've, you know, done a lot of work with that I can, can lean on. And, and I, and I think the other, the other thing I also so trust is, uh, is that, you know, that, that ultimately the most important thing is you want people that I, I, I'm thick skinned, not that I don't have feelings, but I'm thick skinned. And so one of the things I prize in people is I don't want anybody to embarrass me publicly. I don't want anybody to call me out or, you know, do any things that would cause that kind of a that kind of reaction. But but I really appreciate people who can be New York direct with you and say, hey, Mark, I don't think you're looking at this clearly, or this is, you know, and and put it in perspective for me because there's so many people out there, you know, Nick, you've been very, very successful. So for every person you find like that, you'll probably find 20 people that'll say, you're beautiful, baby, you're fantastic, you know, because there are things that you can do to help their business. And and I think when, you know, sometimes when you've got the ability to to support and help a lot of people, you don't always get the straight information back from people. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, so, you know, so when I ask you a question, I want you to tell me, even if it might be temporarily hurtful, I won't make it about you and I'll make it about my behavior or my decision making. Uh-huh. Where okay. you know, where, if we work together on your systems and processes, we'll be as straightforward as. <laughs> I, I I appreciate. It. I'm not I'm not looking to feel good. I'm looking to yeah. build the world class organization. Oh. It's or but there but there are a lot of people like that in that way. Like I always ask Nick, like when I'm coaching people, I go, Nick, do I have the your permission to coach you? Yeah. And you know, and can I? And and a few times I've had that permission to coach people, and they were like, if they didn't cry, they want. I didn't know if they're going to punch me in the nose or cry, but <laughs> but it was but it was uh, yeah. And, and I wasn't trying to be cruel. I was trying to be kind, but well, trying actually, to help them. It'd be doing them a disservice and hurting them if you didn't do that. But yeah, but it's, you know, there's, there's a, there's a lot of, lot of, by the way, there's a lot of coaches out there that it's about the feel good and it's not about the work sometimes. And I, and I think I'd rather, you know, I'd rather, and again, I think you need to know your audience, you know, but I'm also, I also know when, you know, when uh, Lisa asked me, does that dress make me look fat? And I say, it's not the dress. That's not the right answer either. You know, I'm asking, <laughs> <laughs> it's not the dress. Uh, Here's by, by, by the way, she is very fit and thin, so she will not be offended by that, uh, <laughs> by that, by that uh, conversation. Yeah. Uh, but it, but it's, but so, so I, I just think it's, I, I appreciate, I appreciate you. I think that oh, I'll just end this by saying, I, I think that anybody that I know should read the book, Come Up From Air. I think I'm going to order, in fact, one of the things I'm going to be inspired today to do, Nick, is order, you know, uh, uh, some more copies that I can get out to some friends that I think could benefit from the work right. because uh, everybody's suffering for the problems that you discuss. And I just want to take, thank you for taking time out of your really busy schedule to spend a few minutes with oh, me. Thank you very much. Um, I respect you as a person and entrepreneur, so it was a pleasure being on. And if you need more books, just reach out. We We get a discount through the distributor so we can get you a bunch of copies if you need any. Well, that, that's great. Uh, I'll, uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, one of the things I'd like to do is I'd like to, you know, I don't know if you're the right person or not, but I, I was serious about that as I'd like to have my organization, I don't know if it's consulting with you or one of the folks yeah, on your absolutely. team about what we do next. Well, we'll set up a, a separate call. We could, we could talk about that, but yeah, thanks. absolutely. Um, well, thanks for having me on. And um, if, if people do want to get the copy of the book, it's on Amazon, but also we set up a website and we both worked with Amber who, Put my website together. She's awesome. Uh, and that's comeupforair.com. There's a bunch of additional free resources that we put together that go along with the book. So if you go there, you can find where to buy the book, but also all the free resources. And then for our services, uh, getleverage.com is, is, is the training and consulting company. So we've got different uh, training programs and all the different tools we talk about. Yeah, we, I, I guess that's our, you know, people who are listening should know that you know, we, we have a lot of commonalities and we have a lot of common friends and uh, other things like that. In fact, I sit on the board of one of the companies Tony Robbins founded. Oh, really? Uh, so, so I think if we got <laughs> together over a few cocktails, we would, uh, we would, we we would have a lot of connections that we we do don't even know. But, but, but the way we met was Amber Vilhauer from NGNG, and I will tell you, she's a stone cold killer. It's so, great. She's, yeah, she's she's got good energy. I mean, we spoke to a bunch of people, and then like when I interacted with her, I'm like, okay. I know that I can go to war with you for like the next, cause it's doing a book. It's like, it's insane. The amount of work. So I'm like, do I want to spend four months of my life with this person? And you know, she's, she's just, she's sharp and has great energy. Yeah, I, I agree. As you do as well. Thank, Thank you for you. being here and uh, we appreciate you and I will be in touch.
on those other issues. Sounds good. Thanks. For Thanks, Nick. Mark. All right. Bye-bye. Bye.